Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 76 of the Stanford MLS seminar series. Um, today, of course, we're or, or this year, we're, we're very excited to be partnered with CS324 Advances and Foundation Models. Um, today, I'm joined by Michael. Say hi. Hello. And Ivanica. Hey. Um, and today, our guest is Jack Ray from OpenAI. He's got a very exciting talk uh, prepped for us about compression and AGI. Um, so, so we're very excited to, to listen to him. As always, if you, have, if you have questions, you can post them in YouTube chat, or if you're in the class, there's that Discord channel. Um, so so to keep the questions coming, and after his talk, we will we'll have a great discussion. Um, so with that, uh, Jack, take it away. Okay, fantastic. Thanks a lot. And great. Good. Okay, so... Um, Today, I'm gonna to talk about compression for AGI. And the theme of this talk is that I want uh, people to kind of think deeply about uh, foundation models and their training objective and um, think deeply about kind of what are we doing? Why does it make sense? What are the limitations? Um, this is quite a important topic at present. I think there's a huge amount of interest in this area in foundation models, large language models, their applications. And a lot of it is driven very reasonably just from this principle that it works and it works. So it's interesting. But if we just kind of sit within the kind of it works realm, um, it's hard to necessarily predict or have a good intuition of why it might work or where it might go. So some takeaways that I want to hope people like people hopefully to take from this talk are some of them are quite pragmatic. Um, so I'm going to talk about some background on the minimum description length and why it's uh, seeking the minimum description length of our data may be an important role in solving perception. Uh, I want to make a particular uh, point that generative models are actually lossless compressors, and specifically uh, large language models are actually state-of-the-art lossless compressors, uh, which may be a counterintuitive point to many people, uh, given that they are very large and use a lot of space. And I'm going to unpack that in detail. Um, and then I'm also going to kind of uh, end on some notes of limitations of the approach of compression. So let's start with this background, minimum description length and why it relates to perception. So even going right back to the kind of ultimate goal of learning from data, uh, we may have some set of observations that we've collected, some set of data that we want to learn about, which we consider this small red circle. Uh, and we actually have a kind of a two-pronged goal. We want to learn like uh, how to kind of uh, predict and understand our observed data with the goal of understanding and generalizing to a much larger set of universe of possible observations. Uh, so we can think of this as, um, if we wanted to learn from uh, dialogue data, for example, we may have a collection of dialogue transcripts, but we don't actually care about only learning about those particular dialogue transcripts. We want to then be able to generalize to the superset of all possible valid conversations that a model may uh, come across, right? So what is an approach, to, what is a very like uh, rigorous approach to trying to learn to generalize? Well, I mean, this has been a philosophical question for multiple thousands of years. Um, and even actually kind of fourth century BC, uh, there's like some pretty good, um, principles that philosophers are thinking about. So Aristotle had this notion of, um, assuming the superior superiority of the demonstration, which derives from fewer postulates or hypotheses. So this notion of, uh, if we have some set of, um, um, simple set of hypotheses, um, then this is probably going to be a superior description uh, of a demonstration. Now, this kind of general kind of simpler is better um, theme is more recently attributed to William of Ockham, 14th century, Ockham's razor. This is something many people may have encountered during a machine learning or computer science class. He is essentially continuing on this kind of philosophical theme. The simplest of several competing explanations is always likely likeliest to be the correct one. Um, now, I think we can go even further than this. Uh, within machine learning, I think right now, Occam's razor is almost used to defend almost every possible angle of research. But I think one actually very rigorous incarnation of Occam's razor 
is from Ray Solonoff, Solonoff's theory of inductive inference, 1964. So we're almost at the present day. And he says something quite concrete and actually mathematically proven, which is that if you have a universe of data, which is generated by an algorithm, then observations of that universe, so this is the small red circle, encoded as a data set, are best predicted by the smallest executable archive of that data set. So that says the smallest lossless prediction, or otherwise known as the minimum description length. So I feel like that final one is actually putting into mathematical and quite concrete terms um, these kind of notions that have existed through time in philosophy. And it kind of, we could even relate this to a, a pretty, I feel like that as a quite a concrete and actionable um, retort to this kind of um, quite um, murky original philosophical question. But if we even apply this to a well-known philosophical problem, Searle's Chinese Room 4 experiment, where there's this notion of a computer program or even a person kind of within, within a room that is going to perform translation from English, English to Chinese. Uh, and they're going to specifically use a complete rule book of all possible um, inputs, all possible, say, English phrases they receive, and then and then the corresponding, say, Chinese translation. And the original question is, does this person kind of understand how to perform translation? Uh, and I, I think actually this compression argument, this Ray Solonoff's compression argument is going to give us something quite concrete here. So uh, this is kind of going back to the small red circle, large white circle. If, if we have all possible translations and then we're just following the rule book, this is kind of the least possible understanding we can have of translation. If we have such a giant book of all possible translations, and it's quite intuitive. If we all we have to do is coin a new word or have a new phrase or anything which just doesn't actually fit in the original book, this system will completely fail to translate because it has the least possible uh, understanding of translation and it has the least understandable version of translation because that's the largest possible representation of the, the task, the data set. However, if we could make this smaller, maybe we kind of um, distill, sorry, we distill this to a smaller set of rules, some grammar, some basic vocabulary, and then we can execute this program. Maybe such a system has a better understanding of translation. So we can kind of grade it based on how compressed this rule book is. And actually, if we could kind of compress it down to the kind of minimum description, like the, the most compressed format of the task, we may even argue such a system has the best possible understanding of translation. Um, now, for foundation models, we typically are in the realm where we're talking about a generative model, one that places probability on natural data. And what is quite nice is we can actually characterize the lossless compression of a data set using a generative model in a very precise mathematical format. So Ray Solonoff says we should try and find the min minimum description length. Well, we can actually try and do this practically with a generative model. So the size, uh, the lossless compression of our data set D can be characterized as the negative log likelihood from a generative model evaluated over D, plus the description length of this uh, generative model. So for a neural network, we can think of this as the amount of code to initialize the neural network. That might actually be quite small. Uh, this is not actually something that would be influenced by the size of the neural network. This would just be the code to actually instantiate it. So it might be a couple of hundred kilobytes to actually implement a code base which uh, trains a transformer, for example. And actually, this is quite a surprising fact. So what does this equation tell us? Does it tell us anything new? Well, I think it tells us something quite profound. The first thing is we want to minimize this general property, and we can do it via two ways. One is via having a generative model which has better and better performance over our data set, that is a lower and lower negative log likelihood. But also, we are going to account for the prior information that we inject into F, which is that we can't stuff F full of priors such that uh, maybe it gets better performance, but overall it does not get better compression. Um, so on that note, yeah, uh, compression is a, a cool way of thinking about how we should best model our data. And it's actually kind of a non-gameable objective. So contamination is a big problem within uh, machine learning and trying to evaluate progress is often hampered by notions of whether or not test sets have leaked into training sets. Well, with compression, this is actually not, not something we can game. So imagine we pre-trained F on a whole data set D such that it perfectly memorizes the data set, aka such that the probability of D is one, log probability is zero. In such a case, if we go back to this formula, the first term will zip to zero. However, now, essentially by doing that, by injecting and pre-training our model 
on this whole data set, we have to add that to the description length of our generator model. So now F not only contains the code to train it, et cetera, but it also contains essentially a description length of D. So in this setting, essentially pre-contaminating F, it does not help us optimize the, the compression. And this contrasts to regular test set benchmarking, where um, we may be just measuring test set performance and hoping that measures generalization and is essentially a proxy for compression. And it can be, but also we can find lots and lots of scenarios where we essentially have variations of the test set that have slipped through the net in our training set. And actually, even right now within labs, comparing large language models, this notion of contamination uh, affecting eval results is a continual kind of thorn in, um, in, in the side of kind of clarity. Okay, so we've talked about the kind of philosophical backing of the minimum description length and maybe why it's a sensible objective. Uh, and now I'm going to talk about it concretely for large language models. And we can kind of map this to any uh, generative um, model, but I'm just going to kind of ground it specifically in large language model. So if we think about what is the log prob of our data set D, well, it's the sum of our next token prediction uh, of tokens over our data set. Um, so this is something that's essentially our training objective. If we think of our data set D um, and we have one epoch, then this is the sum of all of our training loss. So it's a pretty tangible term. It's a real thing we can measure. And F is the description length of our transformer language model. Uh, and actually, there are people that have implemented a transformer and a training regime just without any external libraries in about, I think, 100 to 200 kilobytes. So this is actually something that's very small. Um, and, and as I said, I just want to enunciate this. This is something where it's not dependent on the size of our neural network. So if a piece of code can instantiate a 10-layer transformer, the same piece of code, you can just change a few numbers in the code. It can instantiate a 1,000-layer transformer. Actually, the description length of our initial transformer is unaffected really by how large the actual neural network is. And we're gonna go through an example of actually using a language model to losslessly compress, where we're gonna see why this is the case. Okay, so let's just give like a specific example and try and ground this out further. So, okay, Llama was a very cool paper that came out from FAIR just like late last week. I was looking at um, the paper, here's some training curves. Um, now, forgetting the smaller two models, there are the two largest models are trained on one epoch of their data set. So actually, we could sum their training losses, uh, aka this quantity. And we can also roughly approximate the size of, of, the, um, of the code base that was used to train them. Um, and therefore, we can see like, OK, which of these two models, the 33B or the 65B, is the better compressor? And therefore, which would we expect to be the better model at generalizing and having greater set of capabilities. So it's pretty, it's going to be pretty obvious at 65B. I'll tell you why. Firstly, just to drum this point home, these models all have the same description length. They have different number of parameters, but the code that's used to generate them is actually of same, of same complexity. However, they don't have the same integral of their training loss. 65B has a smaller integral under its training loss. And therefore, if we plug, if we sum these two terms, we would find that 65B essentially creates the more concise description of its training data set. Okay, so that might seem a little bit weird. I'm going to even plug some actual numbers in. Let's say we assume it's about one megabyte for the code to instantiate and train the transformer. And then if we actually just calculate this roughly, it looks to be about, say, 400 gigabytes. Um, your sum of your log loss, converting it into bits and then bytes. It's going to be something like 400 gigabytes. And this is from an original data set, which is about 5.6 terabytes of raw text. So 1.4 trillion tokens times four is about 5.6 terabytes. So that's a compression rate of 14x. Um, the best text compressor on the Hutter prize is 8.7x. So the takeaway of this point is um, actually, as we're scaling up and we're creating more powerful models and we're training them on more data, we're actually creating something which actually is providing a lower and lower lossless compression of our data, even though the intermediate model itself may be very large. OK, so now I've talked a bit about how large language models are state-of-the-art lossless compressors, but I just want to maybe go through the mechanics of how do we actually get a something like a generative model to literally losslessly compress. This may be something that's quite mysterious. Like, what is happening? Like, when you actually losslessly compress this thing, is it the weights? 
or is it something else? So I'm going to give us a hypothetical kind of scenario. We have two people, Satya and Sundar. Satya wants to send a data set of the world's knowledge encoded in D to Sundar. They both have access to very powerful supercomputers, but there's a low bandwidth connection. We are going to use a trick called arithmetic encoding uh, as a way of communicating the data set. So say we have a token X at time step T from some vocab and a probability distribution P over tokens. Arithmetic encoding, without going into the nuts and bolts, is a way of allowing us to map our token X, given our probability distribution over tokens, to some uh, Z, where Z is essentially our compressed um, transcripts of data, and Z is going to use exactly minus log 2 PT XT bits. So uh, the point of this step is um, like arithmetic encoding actually maps it to some kind of like floating point number as it, as it turns out. Uh, and it's a real algorithm. This is like something that exists in the real world. It does require um, technically infinite precision to, to use exactly these number of bits. And otherwise, you, maybe you're going to pay a small cost for implementation, but it's roughly approximately uh, optimal in terms of the encoding. And we can use arithmetic decoding um, to take this encrypted transcript. And as long as we have our probability distribution of tokens, we can then recover the original token. So we can think of our probability, distri probability distribution as kind of like a key that can allow us to kind of lock in a compressed copy of our token and then unlock it. So if P is uniform, so there's no information about our tokens, then this would be just one over V. P is just one over the size of V. So we can use log two V bits of space. Uh, that is just essentially the same as naively storing in binary uh, our, our XT token. If P is an oracle, so it knows like exactly what the token was going to be, so P of X equals one, then log two P equals zero, and this uses zero space. So these are the two extremes. And obviously what we want is a generative model which better and better uh, models our data and therefore uses less space. So what would actually happen in practice is Satya can take his data set, of tokens, train a transformer, and get a subsequent set of probabilities uh, over the tokens, like so next token prediction, and then use arithmetic encoding to map it to this list of transcripts. And this is going to be of size sum of negative log likelihood of your transformer over the data set. And he's also going to send, he's going to send that list of transcripts and some code that can deterministically train a large transformer. And so he sends those two things. What does that equal in practice? The size of F, the size of your generative model description, plus the size of your some of your negative log likelihood of your data set. So as you can see, it doesn't matter whether the transformer was 1 billion parameters, 1 trillion parameters, plus plus. He's not actually sending the neural network. He's sending the transcript of encoded logits plus the code. And then on the other side, Sundar can run this code, which is deterministic. Uh, the mod, he's going to run the neural network. It gives a probability distribution to the first token. He's going to use arithmetic decoding with that to get his first token. He can either train on that or whatever the code does to then continue on, predict the next token, et cetera, et cetera. And essentially, iteratively go through and recover the whole data set. Um, so this is kind of like a, almost a thought experiment, because in practice, to send this data at 14x compressed, compression, say, if, if we're talking about the LAMA model, uh, it's, it's a bit more compressed than GZIP, but this is requiring a huge amount of intermediate compute, which is to train a large language model, which feels inhibitive. But this thought experiment is really derived not because we actually might want to send data on a smaller and smaller bandwidth, it's more so just derived to kind of explain and prove why we can actually losslessly compress with language models and why that is their actual objective. Um, and if this kind of setup feels a little bit contrived, well, the fun fact is this is the exact setup that Claude Shannon was thinking about um, when he kind of proposed language models in the 40s. He was thinking about having a discrete set of data and how can we better communicate it over, low, over a low bandwidth channel. And language models and entropy coding essentially was the topic that he was thinking about at Bell Labs. Okay, so we've talked mechanically about, well, we've talked about the philosophy of kind of why do, why, why be interested in minimum description length relating it to generalization, talked about why generative models are lossless compressors, 
talked about why our current large language models are actually state-of-the-art lossless compressors and are pr providing some of the most compressed representations of our source data. So let's just think about solving perception and, and moving towards AGI. What's the recipe? Well, it's kind of a two-step process. One is collect all useful perceptual information that we want to understand. And the second is learn to compress it as best as possible with a powerful foundation model. So the nice thing about this is it's not constrained to a particular angle. Uh, for example, you can use any research method that improves compression. And I would posit that this will further advance our capabilities towards perception based on this rigorous foundation. So that might be a better architecture. It may be scale, further scaling up data and compute. This is in fact something that's almost become a meme. People say scale is all you need. Um, but truly I think scale is only gonna benefit as long as it is continuing to significantly improve compression. But you could any use any other technique. And this doesn't have to be just a regular generative model. It could even, we could even maybe spend a few more bits on the description length of F and add in some tools, add in things like a calculator, allow it to make use of tools to better predict its data allow it to retrieve over the past, use its own synthetic data to generate and then learn better. There's many, many angles we could think about that are within the scope of a model, better, better compressing its source data to generalize over the universe of possible observations. I just wanna remark at this point on a very common point of confusion on this topic, which is about lossy compression. So I think it's a very reasonable um, thought to maybe confuse what a neural network is doing with lossy compression, especially because information naturally seeps in from the source training data into the weights of a neural network. And a neural network can often memorize, often does memorize and can repeat many things that it's seen. Um, but it doesn't repeat everything perfectly, so it's lossy. Um, and it's also kind of a terrible lossy compression algorithm. So if in the lossy compression case, uh, you would actually be transmitting the weights of the parameters of a neural network, and they can often actually be larger than your source data. So I think there was a very interesting New Yorker article about uh, about this kind of topic in general, kind of thinking about you know what are what are language models doing, what are foundation models doing, uh, and I think there's a lot of confusion in this article specifically on this topic, where um, from the perspective of lossy compression, a neural network feels very kind of suboptimal. It's losing information in red, so it doesn't even do. Uh, reconstruction very well, and it's potentially bloated and larger and has all these other properties. I just want to take this kind of point to reflect on the original goal, which is we really care about understanding and generalizing to the space of the universe of possible observations. So we don't care and we don't train towards reconstructing our original data. Um, and I think if we did, then this article basically concludes like, if we did just care about reconstructing this original data, like why do we even train over it? Why not just keep the original data as it is? And I think that's a very valid point. Uh, but if we care instead about loss, like a lossless compression of this, then essentially this talk is about linking that to this wider problem of generalizing to many, many different types of unseen data. Great, so I've talked about the mechanics of compression with language models and linking it to this confusion of lossy compression. What are some limitations that I think are pretty valid? Um, so I think there's one concern with this approach, which is that uh, it may be just the right thing to do or like a, an unbiased kind of attempt at solving perception, but maybe it's just not very pragmatic uh, and actually trying to kind of model everything and compress everything it may be kind of correct, but very inefficient. So I think image level modeling is a good example of this, where uh, modeling a whole image at the pixel level has often kind of been prohibitively expensive to like work incredibly well. Um, and therefore people have changed the objective or, or, or ended up modeling at a slightly more semantic level. Um, and I think even if it maybe seems plausible now, we can go back to pixel level image modeling and maybe we just need to tweak the architecture. If we turn this to video, modeling every pixel of every frame, it really feels prohibitively crazy and expensive. So one limitation is, you know, maybe we do need to kind of first filter, like what are, what are all the pieces of information that we know we definitely are still keeping and we want to model, but then try and have some way of like filtering out the extraneous uh, computation, the, the kind of bits of information we just don't need 
and then maybe we can then filter out to a much smaller subset and then and then we losslessly compress that. Um, another very valid point is, and I think this is often framed uh, to people that maybe are thinking that this is like the only ingredient for AGI, is that crucially there's lots of just very useful information in the world that is not observable. And therefore we can't just expect to uh, compress all observable observations, achieve AGI, because there'll just be lots of things we're missing out. Um, so I think a good example of this would be something like uh, alpha zero, uh, so playing the game of Go. Um, I think if you just observe the limited number of human games that have ever existed, one thing that you're missing is all of the intermediate search trees of all of these expert players. And one nice thing about something like alpha zero with its kind of self-play mechanism is you essentially get to collect lots of data of intermediate search trees of many, many different types of games. Um, so that kind of unpolicy behavior of like actually having an agent that can act and then source out the kind of data that it needs, I think is still very important. So I'm in no way kind of diminishing uh, the importance of RL or unpolicy kind of behavior. Um, but I think, yeah, for, for everything that we can observe, um, th this is kind of like the compression story ideally applies. Great, so going to conclusions. Um, so compression is a has been a objective that actually we are generally striving towards as we build better and larger models, which may be counterintuitive given the models themselves can be very large. Um, the most known entity right now, the one on a lot of people's minds to better compression is actually scale, scaling compute, um, and and maybe even scaling memory. But scale isn't all you need. There are many algorithmic advances out there. Uh, I think very interesting research problems. And, and if we look back, uh, basically all of the major language modeling advances have been synonymous with far greater text compression. So even going back from uh, the creation of n-gram models on pen and paper, and then kind of bringing them into computers and then having like kind of computerized huge tables of n-gram statistics of language, this kind of opened up the ability for us to do um, things like speech to text with a, a reasonable accuracy. Um, bringing that system to uh, deep learning via RNNs has allowed us to have much more fluent text that can span paragraphs and then actually be uh, applicable to tasks like translation. And then in the recent era of large-scale transformers, we're able to further extend the context and extend the model um, capabilities via compute such that we are now in this place where um, we're able to use language models and, and foundation models in general um, to understand very, very long spans of text and to be able to create incredibly useful or incredibly tailored, incredibly interesting um, generations. So I think this is going to extend, but it's a big and interesting open problem. Uh, what are going to be the advances to kind of give us further paradigm shifts in this kind of compression, uh, improved compression? Great. So um, yeah, this talk is generally just a rehash of the message of former and current colleagues of mine, especially Marcus Hutter, Alex Graves, Joel Vaness, and Ilya Sutskova. So I just want to acknowledge them. And uh, thanks a lot for listening. I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, chatting about some questions. Great. Thanks so much, Jack. Um, I'm actually going to ask you to keep your slides on the screen because I think we had some uh, questions about uh, just kind of uh, understanding the um, some some of the mathematical statements in the mm. talk. So I think it would be helpful to, to kind of go, go yeah. back over some of the slides. Yeah, that's um, great. I think uh, some people were confused a bit by the arithmetic decoding. Um, so in particular, uh, maybe it would be useful to, to go back to discussion of the arithmetic decoding. And uh, I think people are a bit confused about um, how is it possible for the receiver to uh, decode the message and get the original data set back without mm. having access to the trained model. Yeah. Um, you, well, OK. Um, I'll do it in two steps. So one, let's just imagine uh, they don't have the fully trained model, but they have a partially trained model. And so they are able to get a next token prediction. And then um, they have they, the, the receiver also has some of the encoded transcript ZT. This allows them, I guess, maybe here in the case of language modeling, this would look like xt plus one, say, if it was like pt plus one. But anyway, um, this may allow them to recover the next token. 
and then they're going to build it up in this way. So maybe I'll just delay on this particular slide. The idea it would look like is we we they, the receiver does not receive the neural network. It just receives the code to instantiate kind of the fresh neural network and run the identical training setup uh, that it saw before. And obviously the training setup as it saw before, we're gonna imagine like batch size of one, one token at a time, just for simplicity. So, uh, and let's just imagine maybe there's like a beginning of text token here first. So, so the receiver, so now he just has to run the code at first. There's no, nothing to decode yet. There's no tokens. And there's a fresh neural network uh, that's going to give us like a probability distribution for the first token. And so he's got this probability distribution for the first token, and he's got the transcript um, of what that token should be. And he can use arithmetic decoding to actually recover that first token. And then let's imagine for simplicity, we actually like train like one SGD step on one token at a time. So we take our SGD step and then we have the model that's like was used to predict the next token. So we can get that P2 and we have Z2 and then we can recover X2. So now we've recovered two tokens and we can essentially do this iteratively, essentially reproduce this whole training procedure on the receiving side. And as we reproduce the whole training procedure, we actually recover the whole data set. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's a crazy expensive way of actually encrypt, like in, uh, impressing data. And it might feel once again, like, oh, but when, since we're not going to literally do that, it's too expensive. Why do I need to learn about it? And this really is just a way of, it's like a proof by construction in case um, you were like, you know, is this actually true? Like, is the lossless compressed D actually equal to this? And it's like, yeah, like here's how we literally can do it. And it's just the reason we don't do it in practice is because it would be very expensive, but there's nothing actually stopping us. It's not like a completely theoretical uh, idea. Yeah. Okay. So, all right. So to kind of, maybe I'll try to explain it back to you. And then um, if, if people on the chat and the uh, Discord still have questions, um, they, they can ask and then we can, we can get some clarifications. So basically you're saying you initialize a model. Yeah. Um, you have it do like some beginning of token thing, and it'll it'll predict what what it thinks the first uh, what the first token should be, yeah. um, and then you use arithmetic encoding to somehow say, okay, here's the here's the prediction, and then we're going to correct it to the the actual what the actual token is, so that Z one has enough information to figure out what that actual first token is. Yeah, and then you use that first token, run one step of SGD, predict you know, get the probability distribution for the second one. Mm -hmm. Now you have enough information to decode uh, the, the second thing. Like maybe, you know, uh, yeah. Uh, it's like take the argmax, but, you know, take the, the, the third argmax, argmax or, or something like that. Um, and then, so you're saying that that is enough information to reconstruct the, the data set D. Exactly, yeah. Okay, great, great. So, uh, yeah, so I I personally you know I understand it a bit better now, and that that also makes sense why the model, um, you know the the model weights and the the size of the model are not uh, actually part of that that compression. Um, one question that that I also had while um, you know uh, talking through that explanation. So how does that you know compression now go back and uh, how's that related to the loss curve that you get? Um, at the end of training? Is it that the better your model is by the end of training, then you need to communicate less information, just like, I don't know, take our max or something like that? So I just wanna say, yeah, like this is a formula. If we look at this, this is basically pretty much the size of your arithmetic encoded transcript. And this is you, like your the log, negative log likelihood of your next token prediction at every step. So let's just imagine this was batch size one. This is literally the sum of every single training loss point. It, and the, the summing under a curve, this is like the integral under the curve. So this, this value equals this, and it, I, did, I, did, I did it just by summing under this curve. So it's like a completely real quantity you, get, you actually even are getting from your training curve. So it's, it's a little bit different to just the final training loss. It's the integral during the whole training procedure. Mm. Great. So, okay. And then, yeah, yeah. we can think of during okay. training, 
We're going along and let's imagine we're in the one epoch scenario. We're going along and then every single step, we're essentially getting a new kind of out of, uh, out of sample, like a new sequence to try and predict. And then all we care about is trying to predict that as best as possible and then continuing that process. I mean, actually what we care about is essentially all predictions equally and trying to get the whole thing to learn like either faster initially and then to a lower value or however we want. We just want to minimize this integral. And basically what this formula says, if we can minimize this integral, we should get something that's essentially better and better understands uh, the data or at least generalizes better and better. Gotcha. Okay, cool. Um, all right, so uh, let me see. I think now is a good time to end the screen share. Great. Okay, cool. Um, and now uh, we, we can go to, to some more questions uh, in the in the class. So there, there were a couple of questions around um, kind of, uh, what does this compression uh, viewpoint allow you to do? So th there's a couple questions on, so has this MDL perspective kind of um, informed the ways that you would, that we train models now or any of the architectures yeah. that, that we've done now? Yeah, can I, I think the most like immediate one is that it clarifies a longstanding point of confusion, even within the academic community, which is, um, people don't really understand why a larger model that seems to even um, like, why should it not be the case that a smaller neural network, less parameters generalizes better? I think people have taken, um, like principles from like when they studied linear models and they were regularized to have like less parameters and there were some bounds like VC bounds on, um, generalization. And, and there was this general notion of like less parameters is what Occam's razor refers to, um, one perspective this helps is a, a, like I think it frees up our mind of like what is the actual objective that we should expect to optimize towards that will actually get us the thing we want, which is better generalization. So for me, that's the most important one. Even on Twitter, I see it like professors in machine learning occasionally, you'll see like they'll say some like smaller models are more intelligent than larger models. Kind of it's kind of almost like a weird um, um, motif that is not very rigorous. So I think one thing that's useful about this argument is there's a pretty like like strong like mathematical link all the way down. It goes like it starts at Solomonoff's theory of induction, which is proven, and then we have like a actual mathematical link to an objective, and then yeah, it, it kind of like to lossless compression, and then it all kind of links up. So um, yeah, and I think another example would even be like this This very, I think it's a great article, but like the Ted Chang article on uh, lossless compression, which if people haven't read it, I'd still recommend reading. I think once you're not quite in a world where like you have like a well-justified uh, motivation for doing something, then there's like lots of kind of confusion about whether or not this whole approach is even reasonable. Um, yeah, so I think for me, a lot of it is about guidance. But then on a more practical level, um, there are things that you can do that would essentially kind of break, uh, you would stop doing compression and you might not notice it. And then I think this also guides you to like not do that. And I'll give you one example, which is something I've worked on personally, which is retrieval. So for retrieval augmented language models, you can maybe retrieve over your whole training set and then use that to uh, try and improve your predictions as you're going through. Now, if we think about compression, one thing that you can't do, one thing that would essentially be cheating, would be allow yourself to retrieve over like future tokens that you have not seen yet. Um, if you do that, it's obvious, like um, it might not be obvious immediately because it was a tricky setup, but in my kind of like Satya Sundar encoding, decoding setup, if you had some system which can look to the future, that just like won't work with that encoding, decoding setup. And it also essentially is cheating. And um, yeah, so I think, it essentially, it's, a, it's something which would it could help your like test set performance. It might even make your training loss look smaller, but it actually didn't improve your compression. And potentially, you could fool yourself into um, into like expecting a much larger performance improvement than you end up getting in practice. So I think sometimes like you can help yourself try and like set yourself up for something that should actually generalize better and do better on downstream evals than um, by by kind of like thinking about this kind of uh, training objective. I see. It also probably informs the uh, type of architectures you want to try, because if you're, uh, I think that that comment about like the size of the code being important is was really interesting. Because if you need, you know, seventeen different layers and every other 
uh, in every other, you know, a different module in every layer or something then that, that kind of increases the amount of information that you need to uh, communicate over. Um, yeah. And, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, it can be like good and bad just on that note, like right now our setup is essentially the prior information we put into neural networks is actually kind of minuscule really. And obviously, um, with biological beings, we have like DNA, we have like prior as like kind of stored information, which is, is at least larger than really what um, the kind of priors that we put into um, our neural networks. It, I mean, one thing when I was first going through this, I was thinking, hmm, maybe there should be more kind of learned information that we transfer between neural networks, more of a kind of like DNA. Um, and maybe like, I mean, we initialize neural networks right now, essentially like Gaussian noise with some, a few properties. But like maybe if there was some kind of like learned initialization that we distill over many, many different types of ways of training neural networks, that wouldn't add to our size of F too much, but it might like mean learning is just much faster. So yeah, hopefully also the perspective might like kind of spring up kind of different and unique and creative like um, themes of research. Okay. Um, there, there's another interesting question from the class about the uses of this kind of compression angle. Um, and the question is, uh, could could the compression be good in some way by allowing us to gain like what sorts of higher level understanding or focus um, on the important signal in the data might we be able to get from the um, uh, from from the lossy compression? So if we could like for example better control the information being lost, would that allow us to gain any sort of higher level understanding um, about kind of what what's important in the data? Um. So I think that there is like a theme of research trying to um, use essentially just like the compressibility of data as a, at least as a proxy for like quality. So that's one like very concrete theme. Uh, like, I mean, this is a pretty standard pre-processing trick, but if your like data is just uncompressible with a very simple text compressor like gzip as a data pre-processing tool, then maybe it's just like kind of random noise and maybe you don't want to spend any compute training a, a large foundation model over it. Similarly, uh, I think there's been pieces of work. There's a paper from 2010 that was like intelligent selection of language model pre-training data or something by Lewis and Moore. And in that one, they look at, um, they're trying to like select training data that will be maximally useful um, for some downstream task. And essentially what they do is they look at like what data um, is best compressed um, when going from just like a regular pre-trained language model to one that's been specialized on that downstream task. And they use that as a metric for data selection. They found that's like a very good way of like selecting your data if you just care about training on a subset of your pre-training data for a given downstream task. So I think there's been some, yeah, some kind of sign of life in that area. Gotcha. Um... So uh, one interesting question from, uh, from the class. Um, so uh, kind of related to, uh, I guess, how we code the, the models versus how they're actually executed. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so obviously when we write our Python code, especially, you know, in PyTorch, it, get, it all gets compiled down to like CUDA kernels and, and whatnot. Yeah. Um, so how does that kind of like affect uh, your, your understanding of, how like how much information is actually like in the in these yeah. code yeah. like do you have to take into account like the 17 different CUDA kernels that, that you're running through throughout the throughout the yeah this is a great question uh so um I actually oh yeah I forgot to mention that in the talk but basically I do have a link in the slides if the slides eventually get shared there is a link but I am basing um what was quite convenient was there is a, a transformer code base called NNCP which is like no dependencies on anything it's just like a I think a single C++ self-contained library, which builds a transformer and trains it and has a few tricks in it. Like it has dropout, it has like data shuffling things. And that is like 200 kilobytes, like whole self-contained. So that is a good, like I'm using that as a bit of a proxy. Obviously mm -hmm. it, the size of F is kind of hard to know for sure. Um, it's easy to overestimate. Like if you um, packaged up your like, Python code, like, and, and you're using PyTorch or TensorFlow, it's going to import all these libraries, which aren't actually relevant. You'll, you might have like something really big. You might have like hundreds of megabytes or even a gigabyte of, of all this like packaged stuff up together. 
Uh, and you might think, oh, therefore the description of my transformer is actually like, you know, hundreds of megabytes. So I'm just, it was convenient that someone specifically tried to um, mm. find out how small we can make this and they did it by building it um, from scratch essentially. Cool. Yeah. Um, we also had a question about the Hutter prize, um, yeah. which I believe you, you had something in your slide. So the question is, uh, so it, it appears that our largest language models can now compress things better than, um, than, than the, than the best Hutter prize. So yeah. the question is, is this challenge still relevant? Um, yeah. could you actually use the algorithm that you suggest, um, for, for the Hutter prize? Yeah, I'll tell you exactly. Um, I mean, this is something I've talked with Marcus Hutter about. The Hutter prize is like actually asking people to do exactly the right thing. But the main issue was. They, it was focused on compressing quite a small amount of data, and that data, that amount of data was fixed, 100 megabytes. Now, a lot of this kind of perceptual roadmap is like, there's been a huge amount of benefit in, in increasing the amount of data and compute in simultaneous. Um, and that, and and by doing that, we've able to like continue like this training loss curve is like getting lower. Your like um, your compression rate is improving. So. I would say the prize itself has not um has just not been fruitful in like actually promoting compression. And instead, what ended up being the breakthrough was kind of like BERT slash GPT2, which I think um it steered people to the benefit of simultaneously essentially adopting this workflow without necessarily naming its compression. Um I think, yeah, I think the benchmark just Due to the compute limitations, it also requires, it's very like outdated, something like needs like a hundred, maximum of a hundred CPUs or something for like 48 hours. So I think essentially it didn't end up creating an amazing like AI algorithm, but it was just because it really underestimated the benefit of compute, like compute memory, all that stuff. It turns out that's a big part of the story of building powerful models. So does that, yeah. does that reveal something about our current large data sets that you kind of need to see all this data before you can start compressing the rest of it well yeah i think well the cool thing is like because the compression is the integral in theory if you could have some algorithm which could learn faster like initially that would actually have better compression and it would be something that you would expect it as a result therefore that would suggest it would kind of be a more intelligent system and yeah i think like having better data efficiency is something we should really think about strongly and I think there's actually quite a lot of potential cool research to try and learn more from less data. Uh, and right now we're in, especially a lot of the big labs, I mean, there's a lot of data out there to, to kind of collect. So I think maybe people have just prioritized for now, like, oh, it feels like there's almost, almost kind of like an endless reel of data. So we just keep adding more data. But then I think there's without a doubt going to be a lot more research focus on making more of the data that we have. Right. I wonder if you can speculate a little bit about what this starts to look like in, I guess, uh, images and video. I think you had a slide or two at the end where, um, well, like, like as you mentioned, that uh, if your data is not super G zippable, um, no. then, then maybe there, there's a lot of noise. And uh, I believe, um, and, and my intuition may be wrong, but I believe that images and, um, or cer certainly images, they, they appear to be a lot larger a lot, a lot bigger than um yeah. than than text so wow. does it have these properties i've got a few useful thoughts on this okay so one is we currently have a huge limitation in our architecture which is a transformer or even just like a deep component and that is that the architecture does not adapt in any way to the information content of its inputs so what i mean by that is if you have um even if we have a byte level sequence of text data, but we just represent it as the bytes of a UTF-8. And then instead we have a BP tokenized sequence and it contains the exact same information, but it's just four X shorter sequence length. Uh, the transformer will just spend four times more compute on the byte level sequence if it was fed it, and it will spend four times less on the BP sequence if it was fed it, even though they have the same information content. So we don't have some kind of algorithm which could like kind of fan out and then just like process the byte level sequence with the same amount of approximate compute. And I think that really hurts images. Like if we had some kind of architecture that could quite gracefully try and like think at the frequency of like useful thought 
uh, no matter whether it's looking at high definition image or quite low definition image, or it's looking at 24 kilohertz audio or 16 kilohertz audio, just like we do. I think we're very graceful with things like that. We uh, have kind of like very like selective attention based vision. We are able to like process audio and kind of we're able to like have a kind of our own internal kind of thinking frequency that works for us. And this is just something that's like a clear limitation in our architecture. So yeah, right now, if you just model pixel level with a transformer, very wasteful. And it's not something um, that's like the optimal thing to do right now. But given there's a clear limitation in our architecture, it's possible it's still the right thing to do. It's just we need to figure out how to do it efficiently. So does that suggest that a model that could um, you know, switch between different resolutions, uh, like at the one token in time resolution that's important for text versus the, um, I, don't know, I think you mentioned you know, the, the 24 yeah. kilohertz of, of audio. Does that suggest that a model, that a model like that would uh, be able to compress like different Every modalities better yeah. Um, yeah. and have you know, higher sensory? Yeah, that's, I think it's, it would be crazy to write it off at this stage anyway. I think a lot of people assume like, oh, pixel level modeling, it just doesn't make sense on some fundamental level. But it's hard to know that whilst we still have a big uh, kind of fundamental blocker with our best architecture. So yeah, mm -hmm. I think it's, I wouldn't write it off anyway. So Michael is slacking me. He wants me to ask if you follow the S4 line of work. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a really so, important architecture. Sorry, go on. Yeah, I, I was just uh, so S four. Uh, so okay, so I guess for for those for those listening, S four has a property where um, it's a, it was designed explicitly for long sequences, um, and one of the uh, early uh, set of uh, you know driving applications was this pixel level, pixel by pixel image classification, um, sequential CIFAR uh, that they called it. Um, and uh, one of the interesting things that S4 can do is actually switch from um, the, the, these different uh, resolutions by, um, uh, by changing essentially some uh, the, the parameterization a little bit. Um, so does that suggest to you that like something like S4 or something with a different um, you know, encoding would uh, would have these like implications for I don't know being more intelligent or or, or being a better compressor of these other modalities or, or something like that. Yeah, so like on a on a broad brushstroke, like S four allows you to maybe have a much longer context uh, than attention without paying the quadratic compute cost. Uh, there are still other. I don't think it solves everything, but I think it's a, it seems like a very very promising like piece of architecture development. Um, I think other parts are like. Even within your MLP, your like linears in your MLPs, which are actually for a large language model where you spend most of your compute, um, you really want to be spending, well, I'm saying, I, I don't know this for sure, but it feels like there should be a very non-uniform allocation of compute, uh, depending on what is easy to think about, what is hard to think about. Um, and so, yeah, if there was a more natural way of, there was a cool paper called Calm, which uh, it was about uh, early exiting, like essentially when, neural network at some intermediate layer feels like it's 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 done enough compute and it can now just like skip all the way to the end. That was kind of an idea in that regime, but like this kind of adaptive compute theme, I think it could be a really, really big um, like breakthrough towards this. If we think of our own thoughts, it's like very, it's very sparse, very non-uniform. And uh, you know, maybe some of that stuff is redundant from evolution, but but yeah, having like this incredibly homogenous uniform compute for every token uh, doesn't quite feel right. So yeah, I think S4 is very cool. I think it could be, could help in this direction for sure. Interesting. Uh, we did get one more question from the class that I wanted to get your opinion on. So the question is, do you think compression research for the sake of compression uh, is important for these, I guess, for these like intelligence impl implications, um, reacting a little bit to, to the comments on the Hutter Prize? Um, and it sounds like the compression capabilities of the foundation models are kind of byproducts uh, instead of the primary goal when training them. Yeah, so this is what I think. I think um, the compression objective is the only training objective that I know right now, uh, which is completely non-gameable and has a very rigorous foundation of why it should help us create better and better generalizing agents and a better perceptual system. However, 
we should be continually evaluating models based on their capabilities, which is fundamentally what we care about. And so the compression like metric itself is one of the most like harsh alien metrics you can look at. It's just a number that means almost nothing to us. And actually, just as that number goes down, like say, or should I say the compression rate goes up or the, the kind of bits per character say go down, it's very unobvious what's going to happen. Um, so they have to have other evals where we can try and like predict the emergence of new capabilities or track them because those are the mm -hmm. things that fundamentally people care about. Uh, but I think people that either do research in this area or study at, study at university, as prestigious as Stanford, should have a good understanding of why all of this makes sense. Um, but I still, but I do think, yeah, that doesn't necessarily mean it needs to completely govern everything about this area of research and doing research for compression itself. I don't think is necessarily the right way to think about it. Um, yeah, hopefully that answers that question. I wonder if um, that has implications for things like training for more than one epoch. Uh, I think somehow the field recently has um, uh, arrived at the idea that you should only you know, see yeah. all your training data once. Um, yeah. so, I, mm -hmm. I've got a response to that. So actually training for more than one epoch is not, um, it's not like it, if you do it literally, yeah, then it doesn't really make sense from a compression perspective because once you finish your epoch, you can't count the log loss of your second epoch towards your compression objective because a very powerful model by that point, if you did, it could just have like, say it uses retrieval, it's memorized everything it's seen and then it's just gonna get perfect performance from then on. That obviously is not creating a more intelligent system, but it might like, it'll minimize your training loss and make you feel good about yourself. Um, so, but at the same time, yeah, training for more than one epoch can give you better generalization what's happening. Um, I think the way to think about it is the ideal setup would be like in RL, you have this notion of replay. So you're going through, you're going through your epoch. In theory, like all you can count towards your like compression score is your prediction for the next held out piece of training data. But there's no reason why you couldn't then actually chew up and like spend more SGD steps on like past data. So I think in the mm. compression setup, multi-epoch just looks like replay, essentially. Now, mm. in practice, I think just pragmatically, it's easier to just train with, with multiple epochs. Um, you know, so yeah, I think I just want to clear up like compression does not, it's not actually synonymous with only train for one epoch because you can still do replay and essentially see your data multiple times. But it basically says you can only like score yourself for all of the predictions, which were like your next batch of data, of held out data. That's the only thing that's the fair thing to scale at school. Hopefully right. that will Cool. Um, so we're nearing the end of the hour. So I wanted to just give you a chance. Uh, if there's anything um, you know, that you're excited about coming out, uh, that, anything in the pipeline that, that you wanted to talk about, I just wanted to give a, you a chance to kind of give a preview of um, what may be next in this area uh, and kind of uh, what's coming up and exciting for you. Um, okay. Well, I think 2023, it doesn't need me to really sell it very much. I think it's going to be pretty much like every week, something amazing is going to happen. So, um, if not every week, then every two weeks, the pace of innovation right now, I'm sure as you're very aware is pretty incredible. I think there's going to be lots of stuff, uh, amazing stuff coming out from companies in the Bay Area, such as OpenAI uh, and, and around the world in, in foundation models, both in the development of stronger ones, but also this incredible amount of downstream research that there's just such a huge community of people using these things now, tinkering with them, exploring capabilities. So yeah, I feel like we're kind of in a, in a cycle of mass um, innovation. So I think, yeah, it's just strap in and try not to get too overwhelmed. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah that, I mean, it's a it's, it's looking to be a very exciting year. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. Great. Um, yeah. So that brings us to the end of the hour. So I wanted to thank you, Jack, again for coming on. It was a very interesting talk. Uh, thanks, of course, to everybody who's listening online and in the class for for your great questions. Um, if uh, this Wednesday we're going to have Susan John from Meta, she's going to be talking a little bit about the trials of training uh, OPT 175 billion. So that'll be very interesting for us to uh, to talk to her and hear about. 
Um, if you want to, you can go to our website, mlsys.stanford.edu to see the rest of our schedule. I believe we only have one more week left. Um, so it's been, it's been an exciting quarter. Thank you, of course, everyone for participating. Um, and when, with that, we will uh, wave goodbye and say goodbye to YouTube.